Okay, welcome to this slide presentation on American women painters, um, brought to you by the Art Class Online and www.nicholaswhitestudio.com. The selection of painters shown here is a selected uh, and edited version of what is a huge um, body and corpus of work produced by many tens of thousands of American women painters. So um, by necessity, it is uh, a very uh, incomplete overview of American women painters. And it's just a personal uh, uh, choice and view uh, of the narrator. Um, some of the painters are very well known and others um, less well known. So uh, we're going to look at the first of the American women painters. Um, and that is Mary Cassatt. Here's her self portrait. Mary Cassatt was an expat American who in the 1860s, 1870s moved to Paris. Um, and Paris was a, a beacon for artists, not only from America, but all, from all over Europe at the end of the 19th century. And there was a large American contingent in Paris at the time. Um, Mary Cassatt um, got to know most or a lot of the, uh, the well-known Impressionists, uh, Manet, Degas, and um, in this self-portrait here, it's interesting because it's uh, slightly unfinished and we can actually see her painting process. So you can see, you can actually see how she's starting to outline the lines of the form and then very rapid brushing in, sort of blocking in of these sort of uh, major areas like the bodice, the dark bodice at the top. And then a lot of attention has been made, paid to the face, which is in a more complete state. Um, but again, uh, laying down quite warmish orangey pink tones, first of all, and then adding white to those tones, lightening them to create the, uh, the light and shadow. So the whole face is painted in fairly warmish orange pink to uh, 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 warm violet tones. Um, I want to move on to a later painting of hers, which is a much more is much more finished and a much more brushed uh, painterly um, attitude. Um, you can see she's influenced. She would have been aware and uh, probably knew the painter, Jane, another American um, who was in Paris, James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Uh, Whistler was famous for his um, basically almost um, monochrome paintings, uh, basically dealing with various shades of white. Um, he, would, he would call his paintings Symphony in White, Symphony in Grey. And you can see here how Mary Cassatt is uh, is has, has, has strongly influenced by uh, Whistler's aesthetic. So we, we see here a painting where of quite a simple um, uh, palette, but so rich because she's actually uh, using various tones of white and cream and then mixing them with a little bit of blues and yellows to create the cooler tones, these blue greens. And, and the sort of blue greys. But it's a very subdued palette and all, all the better for that because the, the colors, uh, she's, she's basically working within a fairly limited range of colors um, and with some tonal highlights. So uh, you have these love, lovely rich green greys of the upholstery of the chair the, uh, the green greys shown in the mirror. So the, the painting is being united by this cross-referencing of color and the kind of the, the, the greys, the blue greys, the violet greys on the paper, the folded paper. The warm tone is, um, is sparked by the face, which are in tones of sort of um, cool pinks um, and warmer creamy whites. 
So there's warmth in the face and in the hands, but it's it's a beautifully um, beautifully observed and very painterly. There's a lot of the technique that's being used here is a lot of wet into wet painting. So you can see with the fold there, that's that's wet into wet, so that the 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 the, the paint around it, the white paint around that shadow there is wet when the brush is brushed into that shadow and it leaves that lovely kind of soft focus blurring um, uh, um, sort of uh, appearance to the uh, paintwork. Uh, likewise with the, uh, the, um, the dress down here. Um, lovely softly brushed paintwork. Um, another painting of hers, a very charming image, mother and child. And again, the same, uh, same attention to tonal values, again, using a very limited palette of whites and basically uh, pinks, warm, warm pinks and sort of uh, terracottas and ochres. Um, and immaculately, and I mean immaculately drawn, the, the draftsmanship is incredible. Um, so um, I want to move on now to uh, an, an, another American artist um, who uh, was not born in uh, America. Uh, and this is the artist, a fairly, uh, fairly uh, little known artist, Romaine Brooks. Uh, Romaine Brooks, uh, she was born in Rome and then in her early years moved to America, received an education in America, but spent a lot of her working life as a painter, both in Paris and in Rome and in Capri. So she was a very a Europeanized uh, painter and she became mainly known for painting these very powerful um, uh, standing figure portraits of women. And uh, here is uh, perhaps uh, one of her best known paintings. It's a self portrait. And she's kind of, um, uh, she's a cross, uh, she was a cross dresser. And here she appears in, uh, in, 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 in male clothes um, with, with the hat. And there's, again, you can see the influence of James Abbott McNeil Whistler, who had such a profound influence on American artists working in Paris. And this is at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. It's almost a kind of symbolist quality to the way this painting is handled because of these kind of very nocturnal tones. There's something of the night about the painting. Um, in technical terms, again, it's painted in a fairly loose, relaxed manner, a lot of wet into wet painting, um, tonal values again, as in the America set, quite closely related, like in Whistler's paintings, really a, a palette of blues, blue greys and uh, sort of blue blacks um, with this just a shot of white collar, which is so effective this lovely sort of bluey violet shadow that goes over the eyes and the kind of greeny kind of really quite um, sort of um, quite uh, almost sort of uh, you know nocturnal um, sort of spectral light spectral like light of the face there's quite a sort of ghostly pallor um, to the um, to the image with the red lips. Uh, it's a most unusual image, very strong and powerful. Um, again, uh, just from a technical point of view, all these cool colours um, are laid in on a warm white, uh, a warm sort of creamish ground canvas, and you can still see the canvas on the right there uh, peeping through. But look, look, this is a lesson in how to modulate tones. Keep your, keep your composition simple, simple figure, which occupies most of the picture plane. Keep your colors and palette as simple as possible. So we've got dark tones, 
mid tones and light tones, three tones, um, and it, 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 it's, its simplicity is its power and strength. And here's a photograph of Romain Brooks' studio. And we can actually see the scale of these paintings, you know, really big, powerful standing figure portraits. Um, again, pared down to the minimum, very simple um, context for the figures, you know, just a bare wall, shadow cast on the bare wall, or just a table, maybe a door, uh, a chaise long, a couch, reclining figure. So again, you know, these are probably, they look to me to be about seven feet high by about four feet across. Um, beautiful scale, human figure scale. So um, again, think in terms of keeping, keeping the compositions very simple, keeping the palette very simple, and just making a very powerful statement with the figure. Um, another artist uh, I want to move to now, who we have looked at before, George O'Keefe. Um, George O'Keefe was um, born in the Midwest of America, um, but basically um, after receiving her education, um, moved to New York and entered the circle of Alfred Steiglitz, uh, the modernist photographer who um, ran a gallery in New York. And uh, it was through that gallery that uh, O'Keeffe achieved her first um, exposure um, as an artist. She was engaged heavily in early modernist art and here is a classic example of one of her flower paintings. And O'Keefe, like many modernists working in America at the time, had seen a very important show, the Armory Show in New York in 1913. And that was basically exhibiting for the first time all the avant-garde painting from Paris. Uh, artists like Matisse, Picasso, Braque, Deran, and uh, um, I think Kandinsky was in it. And you can see uh, uh, O'Keefe um, is influenced by ideas of modernist abstraction. So ideas of getting back to ideas of essence and using color almost in a, um, what is, um, a, uh, a what is called synesthesia so that um, color not only represents color but uh, represents sounds as well so there's there's almost a kind of uh, uh, you know a cross fertilization of sensations going on here um, there's ideas of spirituality in O'Keefe's paintings so that the the, the flower forms they're kind of like universal forms and they they literally they really are symbolic of uh spiritual essences of of dynamic growth forms of universal growth forms that are found in nature and these were common elements to abstraction at the beginning of the 20th century as we move on we look at a painter of the harlem renaissance uh, Laura Wheeler Waring, um, who's a little known in this country, um, but it's quite obvious looking at this painting that she was aware of uh, currents in new modernist currents in American painting. This was painted, I believe, in the in the late teens or the early twenties. You can see here how she's obviously aware of of developments in in color. Uh, the lovely pink of the background against the blue of the uh, the dress brings to mind the paintings of Matisse with the offset of the skin colour, these harmoni harmonies of colour that are happening and again the beautiful touch of the flowers. So colour is beginning to assume uh, an importance in, in the art of Laura Wheeler wearing 
possibly through exposure to modernism in New York, specifically the Armory show. Uh, uh, another uh, black female artist uh, we are looking at is Louise Malieu Jones. Again, very little known in this country, but you can see here her, her absorption of the modernist aesthetic. Um, you know, the, 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 the whole idea of collaging of different um, elements of a painting, pattern, figures, um, the interrelationship of colour, um, you know, modernist artists in Europe, um, such as uh, Kandinsky, Matisse, um, were basically um, providing American artists with these new uh, formal elements of, of painting, that's to say colour, shape, line, tone, form. And of course, um, Louise Malio Jones is celebrating black culture in this painting because uh, the actual figure I think she's depicting is, is the American jazz dancer who lived in Paris, wonderful woman Josephine Baker, who's seen here, um, who basically wowed Paris in the teens and early twenties. So there's a lovely cross fertilization of visual cultures here, black visual culture, See almost these these, these figures here, um, and 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 European um, modernist avant-garde abstraction. Um, another artist I want to look at, um, who is really taking abstraction to something that we we really understand in post-war American art, and that's Alma Thomas, uh, a black women woman American artist, and you can see how here how she's using, say, one dominant key colour, which is red. And a lot of this red would have been painted underneath the white. So the white is built up over the red. And then the, the red is overlaid again over the, the white. But it's an example of uh, how you use one key colour to create um, almost like a chord, a musical chord of colour so the red is taken to its uh, extension into the warm yellowy orange, and it's taken into its complementary of the green. And the, this sort of figure field, because the, the, you know, the, 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 the color forms, they are figural. Um, and that, that's to say they are uh, sort of almost figure forms on, on a field of color, which is white and whitey pink and whitey green. So it, it sets up this sort of spatial depth between the field of color, which is the white and the sort of the, the green, the green white and the blue white, and then superimposed on that field of white color are the, the figural forms of the red and the green. And you see this really in operation in the work of post-war American artists like Mark Rothko, Adolf Gottlieb, um, and um, the uh, New York School, the American Abstract Expressionist, of whom Alma Thomas is 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 one. Here we're going to look at a later uh, development in her work. So she she kind of moves from the kind of very gestural physical abstraction. Uh, again, I'm thinking of artists like Philip Guston, early early Philip Guston's work, to a much more sort of hands-off, distanced um, approach, where she's actually using just pure areas of colour, almost laid like a sort of brickwork pattern. She's almost like building a wall of colour here. I think this one was painted in the late 50s or early 60s, where she's... Um, not she's kind of uh, relinquishing the gestural in color uh, painting and, and going much more for the pure qualities of color. And you tend to achieve this when you kind of jettison brushwork. So um, the color is just allowed to do what it does, you know, of its own best, which is it activates best when it's just 
put down really quite simply and flatly one color next to another. So we get this real rich buildup of the relationship between the kind of the terracottas and the blues and the blues to the, the warm yellows. And you notice how the temperature of the painting goes up as we ascend the canvas. So it goes up into these very warm tones at the top and it ascends in terms of its tonal values from deeper, darker tones to the lighter tones. Um, another artist who used very formal qualities in her work is, is a Canadian born artist, but she took American citizenship. And that's the abstract painter, Agnes Martin. And now we've moved to a time that's really post-war. And Agnes Martin, while she was still young, moved to a colony of artists in New York at a, at a set of studios called Coenches Slip. That's C-O-E-N-T-J-E-S. And she had studios there with artists like Ellsworth Kelly. And this is post-war New York. And um, she um, basically started producing what would come to be known uh, as minimalist painting. Now, if you look at this painting, I'm sure your first reaction will be, it's just white. Well, no, actually it's not just white. Uh, she has created this sort of very beautiful harmonies of um, very subtle color made by very discreet, very light toned um, patches of colour and lines of colour, very discreet. So we have these bands of blues, light, light blues going into light pinks and oranges, going into light yellows, again back into blues, again into very subtle pinks, subtle yellows and subtle sort of greeny greys. And you see a kind of, you know, the yellow band almost creates a kind of light on a horizon. I mean, what the painting is doing in terms of uh, uh, painting, it's actually generating its own light and it's generating the kind of light that you would see, for example, in the Canadian plains, those huge expanses of prairie and prairie light, which is a, it's an all enveloping light and there is something of the wilderness about Agnes Martin's uh, work because she later, she couldn't stand New York. She had a nervous breakdown and she traveled the country and end up fetched up in, um, uh, I think it was New Mexico or Arizona, rather like Georgia O'Keeffe. She was happy, happily happier in her own company and continue producing these sublime paintings of um, light, um, very, very beautiful, minimalist, uh, subtle um, paintings that speak very much of Eastern philosophy of Zen Buddhism, marvelous calmness to her work. There was a wonderful exhibition at the Serpentine Gallery some years ago, which I saw. If you ever get an opportunity to see her work, please go and see it. Um, we're moving now to, again, another post-war American woman artist, Lee Krasner. Now, Lee Krasner lived in New York and uh, was the wife of Jackson Pollock. Uh, and indeed, Jackson Pollock owes much of his success to the, um, really, to the help, support and the investment, at, sometimes at her own expense, that Lee Krasner made to Jackson Pollock's career. Lee Krasner herself was a great, great artist in her own right. And indeed that was finally acknowledged by the, um, the British uh, art world here because last September or rather September, I think 2019, she was accorded her own one man exhibition at the Barbican Center in London and like Pollock, um, Lee Krasner was an abstract expressionist painter. Um, wonderful um, uh, gestural painting, 
and sometimes with with large large areas of color very very dynamic color um, work as you can see from the photograph of her in her studio very gestural abstraction um, obviously there's cross fertilization sometimes with her gestural work Pollock's uh, later gestural work but I particularly love this piece because of its richness of colour. She's overpainting cooler lilacs over warm, hot oranges and reds. And then this dramatic, the dramatic blacks, really quite collagey. You almost get the sense that it's like torn strips of paper. But I've seen the painting and it's actually paint. Um, another uh, American post-war um, artist of the same generation as Lee Krasner and Pollock, is Helen Frankenthaler, here shown in her studio um, about 1958, 1960. Again, here is her greatest work, um, or most famous work, Mountains and Sea, made by pouring the uh, oil paint diluted with terps onto just raw cotton duck canvas. It's about sort of eight feet by seven feet. Uh, painted actually on the floor, as you can see from here. She just went around the canvas pouring paint. Um, here's another shot of hers later in the 1980s. Again, still working off the floor. And here's a sublime example of her later work, Royal Fireworks. It's a huge painting. It's probably about 10 feet across by five feet high. Um, again, notice the, the beautiful harmonies of colour. One key colour, the yellow, and then she's riffing off that colour. Lovely lilac up there allows the eye to go through a space so that the space is not cut off in the painting. Another here where she's poured the paint in the central uh, section, allowed it to pool and flood. And, um, you know, the white, still showing the white canvas, and then painted around certain areas. Um, Beautiful, beautiful painting. Now here's an American women painter who really comes out of late Monet, Joan Mitchell, again working in, in New York in the 60s, 70s, 1980s, 1990s. These wonderful sort of um, evocations of landscape, of, of uh, flowers, but painted gesturally. So this is quite a large painting probably about 10 or 12 feet across by eight feet high, very gestural. And notice how she's using the white, the white of the canvas is, is animating the color, the gestural color that's placed down the canvas. So it's almost like a, it's an abstract expressionist version of impressionism because she's juxtaposing colors against one another, warm violets against cool blues the warm ochres there, the, the, the tan, the yellow sandy colours against the blues, very dynamic. This later painting of hers, just literally again off the white ground of the canvas, and that white ground is activating all this brushwork that she's just tripping, tripping the brush across the surface. It's a diptych, too large. I mean, it's probably, I think, about eight feet high by about 12 feet across, two separate canvases. And just look at the lovely gestural brush, very simply applied paint, just one touch, a la prima brushwork, a wonderful vivacity. Um, here we look at the work of Micheline Thomas, um, a young black contemporary American woman painter using pop imagery, um, which comes to be a, a kind of hallmark of um, a re more recent American um, painting, uh, where uh, issues of identity become very much to the fore and culture. Um, so, you know, previous American painting that we've been looking at very largely constant looked at nature, the world of nature as its um, kind of inspiration. As we go into the 1960s, we really start to enter a realm where, where culture replaces nature as the uh, source of inspiration. 
and this is seen in the work of artists, contemporary artists like Elizabeth Payton, with her kind of um, sentimental paintings of uh, pop stars and idols. Here we have Keith Richard. Um, but an artist I want to finish with is in Jacob Akanyili Crosby, um, an amazing black female artist who was born in Nigeria, now works in Los Angeles and produces these palimpsests, these texts of both Nigerian popular magazine and newspaper culture, which if you could look at the painting closely, you'd see inscribed in the surface of, of the paint, the, the painting here, painted quite thinly. And then she overlays uh, the, uh, the, those references to her Nigerian culture with um, you know, American um, images of, 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 of yellow, yellow cabs. Um, and you can see here that her paintings integrate Nigerian magazine ads, fashion and lifestyle pictures, and the family albums iconography. So it's really about a cross fertilization, a cross transplantation of um, cultures. And this is very much of the American experience in female painting here. Now, if we look at her work and the work of Micheline Thomas, um, I would just like to finish by um, just really having a very quick last um, resume through the work of Cassatt to Romaine Brooks to Georgia O'Keeffe to Laura Waring. to Louis Malu Jones, to Alma Thomas, Agnes Martin, Lee Krasner, Helen Frankenthaler, Joan Mitchell, In Jacob Crosby, and I just like to not forgetting Micheline Thomas and Elizabeth Payton, and I just like to end the uh, talk with acknowledgments of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington in the making of this PowerPoint presentation. Thank you all very much for your attention, and the lesson will go out uh, very soon after this PowerPoint. Uh, presentation. I hope you found it enjoyable and thank you for listening. Thank you.